<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's open in prayer. Father, we do pray for those who are in Florida. We pray that you would protect lives. And I pray especially for Rick and Alley in their place that's in path of a direct hit. It would please you that you would minimize the damage there. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of getting in your word. We would ask that your spirit would once again be our instructor. And we just thank you for the specific quotations in the Old Testament concerning Messiah. And we ask that you would open up our minds to understand that which we see today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in the book of Acts, if you look at the book of Acts, wherever you have sermons, you're going to see that there are quotes from the Old Testament. In fact, uh, there are like 273, wrote it down here, 237 direct quotations from the Old Testament in the New Testament. So remember that the what we call our Old Testament was the scriptures for the New Testament church as it was developing. So they only had one source of God's truth, and that was what we call our Old Testament. So again and again you will read uh, the scriptures say, the scriptures say. They're not talking about the whole Bible. They're talking primarily about the Old Testament. And to find out where these quotes are, depending on what translation you are using, I have the NIV here, but usually you will see the Old Testament quote in a different font or offset. For instance, if you look at chapter 1, verse 20, For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms. So here's a direct quote from the Psalms. Now, do you see a different font or see that offset? Okay, go over to chapter 2. Look at verse 17. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So here's a direct prophecy from the prophet Joel. Go down to verse 25. David said about him, and then here's another quote from the Old Testament. Go down to verse 34. Yep, 34. And you have the same thing. So I want you to be able to go through the New Testament, and especially in the book of Acts, because you have these various sermons, and you will see that Peter and, and the Apostle Paul are constantly pulling quotes from the Old Testament scriptures as they are saying, this Jesus who you have seen or you have heard has been crucified, has been raised again, this is the same Jesus that the Old Testament prophets are speaking of, or they would say not the Old Testament, but what the scriptures are talking about. And whenever the Apostle Paul would go into the synagogues, he would always go in to persuade from the scriptures. And he'd take the scrolls, or he'd just quote directly from Isaiah, or from Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, or from the Psalms, to persuade the Jews in that synagogue, this is the Messiah, this Jesus is the one that these prophets have been talking about. So, this morning we want to look at Jesus in the Law of Moses and the Prophets, and the writings. So we're going back to our foundation, Luke 24, verse 27 and verse 44. And beginning with Moses, this is after the resurrection, verse 27, Luke 24, 27, and Jesus, this is after his resurrection, he's on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, and he tells them, at the beginning, with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said 
in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he is opening their eyes and their ears to understand that what was written in the scriptures was written concerning him. And then in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. In the law of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. So, we're going to look at the law of Moses, the prophets, and the writings, but not from our Bible. I'm talking about the Christian Bible. We're going to go to the Jewish Bible. Because that's what Jesus was re referring to. So we have to understand Jesus' words according to the context in which he was speaking. So, remember the Jewish Bible we call the Tanakh. And the three letters stand for three different Hebrew words. The T stands for Torah. The N for Nabim and the K for Ketuvim. The Torah, Nabim, and Ketuvim. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Well, let's get back here again. Oops. Where are we going now? This thing just jumped ahead <laughs> again. All right. So let's look at the Hebrew Bible. We have... The last 14 weeks, we've just been in the Torah. So any Jewish friend of yours who says Jesus is not in the Torah, you have 14 weeks of videos to show him. <laughs> Jesus is in the Torah. And the Torah, of course, is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So here's Moses up on Mount Sinai. And when Moses went up to the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. So the Torah is also known as the Law of Moses. It is also known as the Law. It is also known as Moses. Because sometimes Jesus said, Moses and the prophets... Other times, the law and the prophets. Other times, it's the law of Moses and the prophets. And today, we would say the Torah and the prophets. So let's look at these prophets. Because, again, the Jewish uh, grouping of the prophets is different than our grouping of the prophets. Because you have the former prophets. And look what the former prophets include. Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. Now, we never would think of Samuel and Kings to be placed under the prophets, but that's how the Jewish Bible is constructed. So, when we talk about looking at the prophets, we're going to look at the book of Joshua. We're also going to look at 2nd uh, Samuel so that we can see information concerning Jesus. Then we will look at the latter prophets. And the latter prophets include Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. And then you have the twelve prophets. And the twelve prophets include what we know as our Twelve prophets, Hosea, Joel, Joel, Amos, etc. So now we're going to look at Jesus in the prophets. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. The book of Joshua. There's a passage in chapter 5. And here Joshua is just ready now to take his people to Jericho, which is found in chapter 6. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword. 
that was in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Now, apparently, he just saw a soldier, a human being. So he wonders, all right, are you going to fight against us? Are you part of Jericho or who are you? And the answer, neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked, what message does my Lord have for his servant? This man introduces himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. Now either this is a a human being with a great ego <laughs> and a huge imagination <laughs> or this is someone other than just a human being. And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. Now where else have you heard that? The burning bush. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take off your sandals, you are on holy ground. And this individual, who introduces himself as the commander of the armies of the Lord, he's saying exactly the same thing. So when you look at that, let's realize that the name Joshua, Yahushua, is Yeshua for short. And it means the Lord saves. And Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua. It's the same name. <clears throat> she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Yesu, Yeshua, Joshua of the Old Testament because he will save his people from their sins. The commander of the Lord tells Joshua to do the same thing that Moses told, or God told Moses to do, and so this most likely is a Christophany, in other words, an appearance of Jesus Christ in the flesh there in the book of Joshua. In Revelation 19, we see Jesus as commander of the Lord's army. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him and riding on white horses dressed in fine linen. Then you go to 2 Samuel. And when you think in terms of 2 Samuel, think in terms of the person David. Because David is introduced in 1 Samuel. But the entire book of 2 Samuel is all about David. So we should be able to see something about David and be able to quote from David, not only in 2 Samuel, but also in the Psalms. David himself is a type of Christ. Let's look at David, an overview of his life. He was born in Bethlehem. Is from the tribe of Judah. He was a shepherd. He was a prophet. He is a king. He began the Davidic dynasty. He is the son of Jesse. And he prophesied about Jesus. And he had a son named Solomon, from which we get the word shalom. Solomon meaning peace. Now let's look at Jesus. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. 
From what tribe? Tribe of Judah. A shepherd? Indeed. He says, I am the good shepherd. A prophet? Indeed. A king? Certainly. David begins the Davidic dynasty. Jesus completes the Davidic dynasty. He is also called the son of David. He fulfilled the prophecies of David. And Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So when we compare David, we compare the Lord Jesus Christ, we see a lot of comparison, a lot of similarities. But that's not all. There's more. <laughs> Let's look at David's actual specific prophecies about the Lord. Now, I don't have these in any order. So I'm just going to hit them as they come along. Jesus' resurrection. Psalm 16. Now this is a psalm of David. And he wrote this a thousand years before Jesus was born. Now think about that. Think about the possibilities for something that was written a thousand years ago to be exactly as to what happens a thousand years later. Therefore my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now you read that and you say, what in the world is he talking about? Because he's a human being, we know he's going to die. In fact, you go over to Jerusalem and there's the burial. That's where David was buried, among the kings. Rested with his fathers. So what could this be referring to? Well, when we go to the New Testament, go to the book of Acts. Seeing what was ahead, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he was not abandoned to the grave. Nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of the fact. So it is stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. And he was buried with his fathers. His body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see the case. So Peter, in the first passage, Peter is giving a sermon. In the second passage, the Apostle Paul is giving a sermon, and then they're both quoting from Psalm 16. So now we're getting specific. Let's look at Jesus' suffering. A thousand years before Jesus was born, Psalm 22, written by David, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Who would have thought that a thousand years later, Jesus would have repeated the same thing? Again, David's writing, They've pierced my hands and my feet. David wasn't crucified. What's he talking about? They've pierced my hands and my feet. This is the writing of David. <laughs> Same psalm. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Now, to say that this is just circumstantial would be a real stretch of the imagination. Here are three very specific prophecies written by David, and you look at this and you say, I don't know of any time in David's life where they pierced his hands and feet or divided his garments and cast lots for them. I can see where David may have said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So out of the three, only one of them would make sense being applied to David. 
And then we open up the pages of the New Testament. And as Jesus is on the cross, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John 19, these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled, not one of his bones would be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And then in Matthew 27, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So you just look at these three prophecies and you ask, what would be the possibility that a thousand years later, all three of these prophecies in a period of one hour could be applied to one person. But at the time that they wrote that, or you know, back previous to Jesus, did they look at that as being, you know, the, that song as being a prophecy that something like that, or I mean, no, most of the prophets when they prophesied, they wrote, and they then scratched their head. <laughs> what does this mean? I mean, that's, the New Testament tells us that the prophets longed to look into these things. The prophets were wondering. What is this all about? And even Daniel, remember when Daniel was receiving information and he was just asking, what, what does this mean? The only clue is when David says that my pen is the, the skillful writer. Yeah, the skillful writer. That's probably just what he thinks. That's what he thinks. And even, I think it's Paul, Paul or Peter says that David was a prophet and said, but he didn't understand what it was he was even talking about. Psalm 8, from, from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When the children were praising Jesus, when the chief priests, the teachers of the law, saw the wonderful things he did and and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they asked, Do you not hear, or do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he replied. Have you never read? And then Jesus quotes, For the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. So here Jesus is going back to the psalm, Psalm 8. And he's using the very words of Scripture that these religious leaders say they believe. And he says, don't you understand what these Scriptures are talking about? David said, someone is made a little lower than the angels. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him man a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, and you put everything under his feet. Well, when we get to the New Testament, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which things we are speaking, but there is a place somewhere that is testified. What is man that you are mindful of him? Now remember, the writer, we, we don't have, he, he doesn't have the scriptures in front of him. And he doesn't have chapter divisions and he doesn't have verse divisions. So he cannot say, well, if you remember in Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6. Because remember, the Hebrew Bible was made up of nothing but consonants. They were just a bunch of consonants. And, and you had to know Hebrew well enough to know that this is a word, and this is a word, and this is a word. That would be like putting a W, L, P, Q, Z, and R together. And you say, what do, we need some vowels to fit in between those consonants so we know what the word, how to even pronounce the word. So when the writer is writing this, the Hebrews, writer to the Hebrews, 
He says, now, it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone testified, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. Now, in putting everything under him, God left nothing that is sub not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, meaning to Christ, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Now he is crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now all things will be under his control. Again in Psalm 8, you made him ruler over the works of your hands and you put everything under his feet. Again, David is writing about something in the future and someone in the future. When you get to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. And when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And so it's not the Father who is under the Son, but the Father puts everything under the authority of the Son, including judgment. Now, when we look at Luke 24, passage that we've quoted from numerous times, everything's written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In Acts 13, brothers, children of Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that is written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. Notice that phrase, when they had carried out all that was written about him. Do you think these authorities were trying to fulfill prophecy? <laughs> and yet, God used their cruelty and their wickedness in crucifying Jesus, and all of that was working to accomplish God's purpose. It's almost like in Genesis chapter 50, where Joseph said to his brothers, you meant harm to me, but God meant it for good. God used your cruelty to me to save the lives of many people. That's what Josh, that's what uh, he was saying and uh, Joseph was saying in the Old Testament. You guys wanted to kill me. You wanted to get rid of me. And God used your horrible intentions and the way you treated me. He used all of that to accomplish good. And this is what's being said about God used Jewish authorities and used Roman soldiers to accomplish his purpose for the good of mankind. Here plots against Jesus. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then we go, in, we go into the New Testament. 
You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And then he quotes that very passage, Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. And then he adds these words, Indeed, I think this is Peter as he's praying to the Lord, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal, to perform miracles, miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So again, what they did was according to your will and according to your purpose so that good would come. Jesus the shepherd. <coughs> By the way, Psalm 22, 23, and 24. This is a trilogy. All three psalms are written by David. And you will see all three psalms point to Jesus. When I uh, preached on this before, I just want to see how I call what I called these three psalms. Now, Psalm 22, I see Jesus as Savior, Psalm 23 as Shepherd, and Psalm 24 as King. So in Psalm 22, the focus is on Jesus as Savior. Psalm 23, the focus is on Jesus as our Shepherd, and Psalm 24, Jesus as King. Now, I don't know where I got this other, uh, these other names for this trilogy, but someone had written, Psalm 22 is a good shepherd, Psalm 23 is the great shepherd, and Psalm 24 is the chief shepherd. But I don't see shepherd in all three of us, so I came up with a different, a different trilogy here. So, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Then we see Jesus as king. In Psalm 46, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So again, we have a specific... We have a specific quotation or statement, and here's in Hebrews 1.8. But about the Son, he says, and so the writer of the Hebrews quotes exactly from this psalm. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Your righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. So you see how the writer to the Hebrews, in fact, when you look at the book of Hebrews, you'll notice tons of these little indentations because the writer to the Hebrews is constantly quoting from the Old Testament. Again, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's from Psalm 110. In Matthew 22, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? Or oh, the son of David, they replied. And he said to them, how is it then that David speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord. For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Well, no one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any, any more questions. Again, Jesus taking the scriptures, bring it right back. Now, you explain to me what David was saying here. And they knew if they said, well, of course, it's Yahweh says to my Adonai, two different words for God. So if he is David's son, uh, as he put it, how is it that David speaking by the Spirit calls him Lord? If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Jesus, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We've seen this again and again. Here it is, Psalm 110. We saw Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. And then in Psalm 110, David picks this up and says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Where did David get this? I mean, he's writing these Psalms and all of a sudden he goes back to something in the book of Genesis and he comes up says, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's not talking in, about any the priests of his day because they were after the order of Aaron or after the order of Levi. And then all of a sudden we find Jesus is talking about something from Genesis 14. When we get to the book of Hebrews, we find in several chapters in Hebrews. He says at another priest, uh, place, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Now notice the next phrase. And he was heard. Think about that. Jesus offers up prayers to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard. That raised a question in your mind? <laughs> it's like, if he was heard, why didn't God do something about it? <laughs> The father heard his son's cries. The father heard his son cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible tells us here that God, the father, heard his son. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. By the way, if you... Uh, praying about something and it doesn't turn out the way you prayed don't go away and say God didn't hear me <laughs> because God did hear you and there are times when God will not give you the answer you want because he has a greater purpose that's what it was with Jesus the father heard the son pray but the father I'm saying, yes, I hear you. But we have to carry out this plan. Otherwise, mankind will never experience salvation and I'll not have eternity with my creation. There are times you don't get exactly what you pray for because God says, it's not time. It's not time yet. It'll come, but it's not time. This is not the right time. And other times he does that. 
and withholds because he says, I'm trying to protect you. If I give you what you really want, it's not going to be good for you. So there are a lot of reasons as to why God will say, I heard you, but the answer is no, at least for right now. I think I came up with like 21 answers that God gives us. Not just yes, no, or wait, but yes, maybe, but not as you ask. <laughs> yes, but not now. Yes, but you should not have asked. <laughs> there, He gives us a number of yes answers. He gives us a number of wait answers. Might be wait because you're not ready. There are things I have to do in your life before you get what you really want. And there are a number of no answers. And then as you go through Scripture, he gives you reasons for the no. But those are other sermons. Let's get on. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus' zeal for his Father's house. Here David's writing, I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Now, the first part may make some sense for David, because he was the runt of the family. And when the prophet Samuel comes to the house of Jesse and he's going to anoint one of the sons as king. The first son stands up, Eliab. He was tall. He was pow He looked like a king. How do you know he looked like a king? Well, the only king they had was King Saul. And king Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. So Samuel comes and Eliab stands before him and Samuel in his mind says, surely this is God's anointed. <laughs> God says, no, I rejected him. All right, bring the next son. And then the next son, and the next son, and the next son, and the next son, and the next son. And finally, it looks like you ran out of sons. <laughs> so Samuel says, don't you have any other sons? And he said, oh, yeah, we have this little runt out there. He's, he's taking care of the sheep. Well, call him. So young David comes and God says, this is the man after my own heart. This is the one that I've chosen. So the first part of that could make sense that would apply to David, but the second part, zeal for your house consumes me. The insults of those who insult you fall on me. Well, we know that David loved the Lord, but of course, zeal for your house. There wasn't a temple when he was writing this. So he can't be talking about the temple. So what's he talking about? Well, we have to go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, here we are in temple courts. Jesus is there on this special day, holiday. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting on tables exchanging money, or at tables. And so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here! How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was consumed for his father's house. Because he says, this is a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. The Incarnation. Psalm 40. Another Psalm of David. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Burn offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. 
Now, part of this I could see could apply to David. For David to say, I have come to do your will, that would make sense, but it is written about me in the scroll. I don't know any prophecy that David was was going to be uh, born, that he was going to become king, that he would uh, want to do the will of God. So when you look at that prophecy written a thousand years before Christ, you can just see parts of it might apply to David, but then who else is he talking about? Therefore, when Messiah came into the world, he said, he said, Christ said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am, it's written about me in the scroll. Where in the scroll? In the law of Moses and the prophets and the writings. It's written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. So at the incarnation, he's saying, the son saying to the father, this has been written about me, and I'm coming to do your will. And then we even have Jesus' betrayal. Again, this is David. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Well, we can understand that because David had friends who turned on him. But when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they are eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. They were very sad. They began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. And Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Yes. Yes, it is you. Jesus' betrayer. Again, David's writing this. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. And when he has tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. Now, David was speaking about a lot of people who were against him, and he's talking about the wicked. Well, this is picked up in the New Testament. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers I cannot read that. Is that a word? A group numbering about 120. Okay. <laughs> a group numbering about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David. So here is the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouth of David. David is speaking, but not really knowing exactly what he is saying. Now, I can attest to this because there have been times when I have preached, and I can remember several times, it's like having an out-of-the-body experience where your mouths are flapping and words are coming out, and it's like you're, like I'm looking there at this guy preaching. It's like your mind is just totally disengaged. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit taken over and, and is still preaching and your mouth caught up and down like that and it, now I think this is what he's saying about David David is writing these passages and uh, 
as he is writing concerning Judas, well, David's not sitting down there. There's going to be a guy by the name of Judas, and he's going to betray Messiah. No, he didn't know any of that. But brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in this ministry. And with the reward he got for wickedness, Judas bought a field there, and he fell headlong. His body uh, burst open, and all of his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field, in their language, Al-Kadamah, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. And then that's when they chose Matthias to be one of the twelve. Well, we're going to stop here. And uh, because we have some more prophecies of David. And we'll finish up the prophecies of David next week. And then we're going to get into the prophecies of, of Isaiah. And Isaiah, again, very specific prophecies and very specific prophecies fulfillment. But let's ask some questions, make some comments. Uh, open your mics, those of you who are watching with Zoom. And uh, I'm going to take this off. Get out of PowerPoint here. Do you think Matthias is something that God really wanted to take the place of Judas? Or do you think that was Paul's role? We never hear much about this Matthias guy, do we? No, but you don't really hear much about any of the disciples later on. Uh, I want to bring these everybody back here. Well, Open up here. Oh, Matthias. No, oh, Matthias. We, we don't. Yeah. No. Because they just. Okay, you are kind of open here now. Is, is that what God wanted? Okay, can you see us now? Those of you who are watching by Zoom. Yes, we can, Rick. Thank you. Okay. Questions that you might have? I must have thought David was whacked. I don't know. Hey, uh, let me bring you back here, Don. Okay. <laughs> here you are. I'm back up. Okay. You're back up. I had put you under the table because I could hear a lot of noise. And it wasn't that you were bad, it's just that there was some noise, so I thought I'd put you down there. Okay. It, so you could still hear me, but we couldn't hear you. Okay, questions? Rick, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a question. This is John. Okay. Um, he said the name of the Jewish Bible was the Tanakh. Right. And the P.A. stands for Torah. The Nevamim is the prophets. Yeah. What, what is the K? Ketuvim. How, how do you they're, they're the writings. K-E-T-U-V-I. Sort of like a comma. I-M. Ketuvim. And it's the writings. They're the writings. Now... In the one translation, it might be the King James, or maybe it's the, uh, I think it's the King James, where Jesus is speaking in Luke 24, 47. He says, all that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the writings. But the Hebrew word there, or the Greek word there, is actually Psalms. And I think that Jesus was pointing out, because at the beginning there are just two divisions, the law and the prophets. Right. And that's why where you read in Luke 16, Abraham says if they don't listen to the law and the prophets, then they won't believe. Then, then later on, uh, it was divided into the law the prophets and the writings. 
That, that was a later division. So it started out just the Law and the Prophets, then the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. So when the translators were translating that, they thought this is what Jesus was referring to, but it, I believe in Jesus' day it was not that threefold division. It was still just a twofold division. And, and the word there is not writings, but the word is psalms. And I think Jesus was focusing primarily on the psalms because so many of the psalms, not only David's psalms, there are other psalms that talk about Jesus that we'll look at. But David has, today, I mean, all we were doing is looking at David's psalms about Jesus, and we're not finished. So that's where a lot of information concerning Messiah comes from, the Psalms. So the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Thank you. Okay, other questions? No questions from... Is the, field of blood, is the field of blood still there or something? Do we know it is the field of blood? Field yeah. of blood? Yeah, well, there, there's a there's a traditional spot over there where they'll they'll point out that this is where Judas hanged himself. Whether it is the exact spot, I don't know. <laughs> Lots of places they point out things happen, and uh, that's why. I love being up in the Galilee because when you're up in the Galilee, what you see today is so much like what existed in Jesus' day. When you get down to Jerusalem, everything is built on top of Jesus' day. So you have to get down like 52 feet or so below the uh, level of today to get down. When people say, I want to walk where Jesus walked, well, you got to dig to do that. Uh, I know the Via Della Rosa is one of the places people say here's, well most likely it was actually on the other side of Jerusalem where he was walking to begin with and what exists today was not what was in his day. There are a couple places uh, that seem to be authentic in Jerusalem and that is the house of Caiaphas. Of course Wherever there have been special events, they end up building a church and ruining it. So there is a church that's built there at the house of Caiaphas, where they think Caiaphas was. And then you have steps going up to that church. Well, when we go over there, we usually sit on those steps because they believe that this, these are the authentic steps where Jesus had to walk up to go to the house of Caiaphas. So that may be a, an authentic place. And when you get up into the Galilee, there are many more places that you say, yeah, it's probably 90 to 100 percent sure. Like if you're sitting on the Mount of Beatitudes, where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I think it was Washington, University of Washington, who took audio samples of different places over there, and they said, this is the best location acoustically where one could speak to a multitude of people and be heard. And usually when you see movies or pictures of Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount, he's standing up there talking down. No, most likely he was down there talking up because you have this nice, like almost like an amphitheater. And when we were sitting up there on the sermon where he gave the Sermon on the Mount, I remember seeing a little boat out there with two guys, two fishermen, and they were way out there on the Sea of Galilee, and we we're listening to them talk. I mean, just as clear as could be. And we're way up here on this hill. So it's a perfect amphitheater, acoustically, where Jesus could have been down below and then speaking to the multitudes. Other questions or comments? Okay, if not, I hope we've been able to capture this okay for you. And uh, it's hard to believe we're down to two more, <laughs> two more sessions. 
What I might do, if anybody is interested, I have a lot of other videos I could send out to you almost on a weekly basis on, on different subjects, which I might end up doing. But uh, let's just close in prayer. Lord, thank you that you've been able to help us understand how specific these prophecies were and how specifically they were fulfilled. It, it is, just seemed like a total impossibility for this to be circumstantial or what we would call happenstance. No, this is the very word of God being proclaimed many, many years before the events took place. But that's the type of God you are. The God who makes known before it ever comes to pass. We thank you that you are God who makes yourself known to us. In Jesus' name.